You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Black Veins, written by Quadrant, performed by Otis Jiry. Nothing is truly sustainable. Everything will end. This was first made apparent to humanity hundreds of years ago. Their way of life, then, was wasteful, to say the least. This was their downfall. The global warming produced by their laziness stemmed other problems such as drought, famine, and the final blow to them, disease. It was one disease in particular, a superbug as they called it. It was immune to any cures or vaccinations they had, and it was extremely deadly and extremely contagious. It was noticeable by the veins of the infected turning black, and then approximately five days later they'd die. The disease spread through contact and multiplied quickly. The weak governments of the time in no way could bear the stress of these issues and the riots they caused. There was a group of scientists who started working on a sustainable civilization after it became clear the one they were living in would soon fall. This small group managed to get roughly 50,000 people to help them with this goal. Each of these people had some sort of skill that would be helpful to a new civilization such as architecture, construction work, tailoring, political science, farming, etc. All of these people joined together to plan this new society out and when done implemented it in tunnels dug by the group deep underneath northern Canada. Now, nearing a millennium later, there are about five million humans living in ever-expanding underground communes, the descendants of the original 50,000. The genetically engineered bioluminescent plants light everything up. A sort of leaf hood grows on top of them when the light is no longer needed. The caves they live in are covered in white plants that get all of their nutrients from the fertile soil their ancestors placed in these tunnels. These plants provide them with food. Others provide fabric for clothing, wood for building, and others purely for aesthetic reasons such as grayish grass that grows under their feet and colorful flowers that add life into the monochrome passages. The caves are wide and split down the middle by a sort of river that extends through the entire system, bridges of wood connecting both sides. There are expanses of dark tunnels that connect the villages in a maze-like manner, rivers going through all of them. The water comes and leaves via the oceans and is filtered through the plants and genetically engineered bacteria, the latter of which protecting against the virus that is still looming above ground and other diseases. Boats travel along the streams from one village to another, offering goods in exchange for other products and or services. Each village governs themselves. War is non-existent, despite many close calls. The population is expanding at a slow rate, more tunnels being dug by genetically altered dogs alongside miners in order to have enough room for the expanding population. Money is non-existent and work is volunteer-based. The largest villages, what one could call a city, are the only places with electricity provided via geothermal means. These cities are places where all the previously mentioned genetic engineering takes place using a method known as CRISPR, or CRISPR. The cities are the only places with weapons and all of them are run by a single government due to the importance of them to the entire civilization. One village, entitled Vicarus, is located five miles to one of the entrance of the entire society. No one ever leaves because fear of the disease above ground has been cemented into them for generations. It's wake-up time. People pour out of their houses carved into the cave walls as the alarm rings, they head to the wooden tables, where people place bowls of fruity cereal in front of them. The milk from the dog-sized cows, who are among the few animals kept as pets in this strange new world. 
One of the people walking around with a breakfast card is named Gabriel. He's a short man at five foot two. He's in his late forties and is well liked around his village and the surrounding villages. His head is bald, save for a black beard with a few gray hairs here and there. Gabriel is one of the few people who does as much work as possible, rather than lazing about doing art or singing or what have you. He finishes passing out his card of breakfast and sits down by a close friend with his own bowl of breakfast. Morning, Amons. He greets his friend with his deep, gravelly voice. How have you been? And how is spending the better half of yesterday in the tunnels? How long does it take to get to Hicklin and back? Boat sprung a damn leak on my way back, and my lamp leaf stopped glowing a bit after that, so I had to walk on foot in those dim caves for a few hours. Though I did bri bring back some sweets for you and your kids. He speaks to Emons. Lightheartedly. Yeah, everyone was pretty worried for you. And we just found yesterday that most of the boats are defective or something. Also, thanks for getting me the sweets, my kids. Uh, they won't stop bothering me about candy. No problem. They finish breakfast and leave their bowls on the table and part ways for the day. Gabriel goes to the garden, an unorganized thing placed by the river. It looks to be somewhat of a mini forest. The trees have branches, acting like roots that curve into the water of the river. The trees that aren't by the water absorb it from surrounding trees by inserting their branches in scattered holes around the trees in a sort of symbiosis where all the trees survive. Other plants grow randomly, their underground roots acting much the same as the trees' branches. Scattered around the border of the garden are chests, each containing upwards of twenty large bags of seeds. Gabriel opens one of these chests and takes out several handfuls of seeds and stuffs his pocket with the seeds. He walks through the garden, digging holes in the soil and putting a seed in each one. After an hour of planting his seeds, he goes to the river to wash off his hands. While he cleans his hands, he spots someone from another village who's going down to the river via a wooden boat with oars. A long branch covered in leaves grows on the side of the boat. In the dark, it would glow brightly. It's also known as a grow leaf. What village are you coming from? He asks the woman curiously. Oh, I'm a miner, just scouting areas to expand the caves. She responds as she keeps paddling in the direction of the entrance to the ocean. That way is nothing but a way to the above ground, he points to the way she's going. She speaks slightly louder so he can hear her as she goes down the river. No harm in looking. He smiles and shrugs, standing up and then walking back to the main part of the village. In the eating area, five young children play around, none older than six. Does anyone want to help me with today's harvest? He asks the kids. In this culture, it's not considered odd to walk around with someone else's kids due to the very small size of the village and how close-knit the community is. Three of the kids walk up to him excitedly. Two of them are Iman's kids. They know him quite well. What is your name? He looks at the young girl he doesn't know. N Nirama. She manages to stutter out. The boy, Yolent, speaks up. She's shy. The other girl, named Jana, the boy's brother, asks Gabriel, How long will the garden take? Oh, an hour or so. I'll give you three for some fruit, if you help. The other kids are still running around. The other kids run from the direction of where the artists are painting the walls of the caves, their hands and clothes covered in paint. They join the other kids in playing. Come on, let's get the food before lunch starts, Gabriel says as he starts walking. The three kids follow behind. Narama stays close to Yolent. After a few minutes, they reach the garden. Gabriel opens one of the chests that sit around the garden and pulls out four baskets, handing one to each child. Okay, he scans around until he sees a red flower 
with heart-shaped leaves jutting out of the ground. He uproots it, and the roots are golden in color and very thick. This is a honey root. We just got our first seeds for these a month ago, and now they're ready. You guys try and find as many as you can and put them in your basket. He speaks in a way that interests the children, much like a kindergarten teacher. The kids nod and start looking for the flowers. For about a half hour, the garden is filled with, Oh, I found another one, and things of the like from the kids. The fun is ruined when ear-splitting inhuman screams are heard in the direction of the main village. More humanly screams ring out as well, all by the tunnel that goes to the entrance. Narama clings onto Yolent, hugging him tight. Jana looks up at Gabriel. Gabe, what was that? Fear is in her voice. I don't know. He motions for them to stay put and then sets down his basket filled with the roots as well as a few other fruits. He goes to the edge of the garden and looks toward the village, squinting his eyes to see it in the distance. He sees people running away from these naked people that look dirty. He can't make out what it is, but something black is all over their skin. He's filled with confusion and wonders what the hell is going on. He stops wondering when he makes out something being mauled by one of them. These people attacking his friends are fast. They catch up to those who run with ease. Gabriel runs back to the kids, holding back tears as the screams continue to ring in the air. We need to go, kids, he whispers. His body is physically shaking. What's going on? Yolent asks as he hugs Narama, who is curled in a ball. I don't know, but we need to go now. We'll be back later, I promise. He doesn't know if he'll be able to keep that promise. Janna nods and holds Narama's hand. Narama shakily stands up and the children follow Gabriel as he starts to run, though slower than he would usually, so the kids can keep up. Gabriel makes it to the cave that leads to the next village, on the opposite side of the tunnel than where the screams were coming from. Narama stops by the entrance of the dark cave. She's at a complete freeze. Gabriel is about ten feet away before he realizes the kids have stopped by the cave entrance. Yolent and Jana trying to pull Narama back into the cave. Gabriel runs back to Narama and picks her up. She starts crying even harder, absolutely terrified of the dark, much more than the unknown thing Gabriel is telling her to run from. He continues to run, going faster now, trying to stay by the kids. The cave thins out at the glowing plants as they become scarcer, leaving them running on a thin piece of ground in the extremely dim light of the cave. Gabriel stops running twenty minutes when the two siblings can't go anymore, even at a slow pace. They sit down on the muddy ground, and Rama is still crying heavily. "'What are we running from, Gabe?' asks one of the children." Gabriel cannot make out which it is through the sound of a rushing river in his heavy panting. I don't quite know, but we're going to Hickland. We'll be safe there. Where? asks the same child. It's a city really close to here, a few hours of running, and we'll be there. Is our dad okay? I, yes, he's okay. Gabriel catches himself before he blurts out that no, he doesn't believe that Iman survived the attack by those people. He starts to sob uncontrollably, trying to do it quietly, so as not to scare the children as they sit in the very dim light of his cave. They sit in silence for near an hour. Yolent and Janna have fallen asleep, cuddled with each other, while Gabe and Narama stay awake from fear. In the direction they ran from, there are many splashes in the river and squishes in the mud, so quiet Gabriel doesn't notice them. But Narama does. She hears it very clearly. She screams and starts flailing around until she gets out of Gabriel's arms, splashing into the water. Gabriel grabs her from the water and pulls her out. She's sopping wet, muddy, crying, and coughing between intervals of screaming and hyperventilating. The two children dart awake, frightened from the loud suddenness of their return to consciousness. Hey, it's okay. We're oh, 
Gabriel is cut off by the unmistakable sound of footsteps coming towards them, a lot of them, about fifty feet away, splashing through water and making smacking sounds in the mud. Gabriel doesn't like this one bit. He picks up the screaming Narama. Run as fast as you can! The panic in his voice scares the kids more than they already were, and adrenaline jumps into their veins. The kids book it down the tunnel past Gabriel, who struggles to run and carry the flailing child in his arms. Gabriel doesn't know if the kids will get lost in the tunnels if he can't catch up, and as the footsteps get closer and the familiar inhuman screeching rings out, Narima flails harder into the mud. She curls up in the fetal position and hyperventilates covered in mud. Gabriel tries to pick her up, but she bites him, taking out a small chunk of flesh from his hand. Nurhama, we need to go! His voice shakes. The things are a mere ten feet from them, visible in the dim light. Gabe looks at the naked creatures. They look human, but have these dark veins all over them, near black. In that moment, Gabe makes one last attempt to pick up Nurhama, only to be met with her teeth and another hunk of meat out of his arm. He runs, deciding that the two kids in front of him would have a better chance of surviving with his help, and his chance is increased by giving up on Narama. Her screams increase for a second before being negated by the screams of the black-veined people. Several seconds later, they stop entirely. Gabe continues to run, not thinking. The only thing in his mind are the two kids somewhere ahead of him. Several minutes of him running as fast as he ever has, he finds the two kids who are sobbing while running, much like Gabe himself. The kids follow Gabe through the tunnels, and they run and run until they can no longer feel their legs, and then run a little more. When they eventually fall into the mud trying to catch their breath, Gabe, who is able to run more because of his fitness compared to the kids, picks them up and puts them over his shoulders and keeps running. The light of the city of Hicklin bathed them a few hours after they started running, Gabriel still carrying them. Gabriel sets down the kids on the ground and collapses to the ground, passed out, and close to death from so much physical exertion. People run towards them. What happened? One woman concernedly asks. Bad things. There are bad things. They're chasing us. Yolent screams while Jana cries on the ground, both still in a disoriented panic. Neither of the kids know what is going on yet, so they can't very well tell the people just how much danger they're in. A woman, drawn in by the crowd, who wears the universal uniform of a doctor, a red-dyed dress, gets through the group and kneels by the kids. Can you two follow me? The woman asks, staying calm. Gabe takes in a sharp breath and wakes up and rolls over on his back, grunting as if it caused him pain. Blood mixed with mud is all over his right arm, and the blood coming from the two bite wounds. Block the, enter the entrance! They're coming! He speaks weakly and with a stutter. Now that he's on his back, people can see his face, and a few people recognize him. They're taken aback by what they're witnessing. They don't know what to do. They have black veins! They killed my, my entire goddamn village! For the love of God, just block the damn entrances! He yells as loud as his weak body can allow him to. The kids start crying again after they heard the village died, but it is necessary for him to say this in order for them to block the entrances. The doctor looks at everyone with a sort of death glare, silently telling them to do what Gabe just said. She tells one of the stronger men to carry Gabriel to the infirmary for her, while she looks at the kids. The man picks up Gabe, and the doctor speaks again to the kids. Kids, follow me. The kids do as told, sobbing loudly as the man holding Gabe, who is passed out again, walks behind them. People are bustling around them, some holding axes to cut down trees, others holding metal clubs with a large spike on the end of them, presumably to defend against the people attacking. They eventually made it to the infirmary, which is carved into the cave's side. 
There are several cots, one of which the man rests Gabe on. The man looks back at the doctor, and the doctor motions him to leave. The sound of axes hitting trees and them falling is heard as the doctor quickly examines the children for any wounds. She finds a few bruises, but other than that, nothing. Go wash yourselves off. I have clothes already. The kids do as told, going to the river and bathing, still whimpering, though not saying a word. The doctor checks out Gabriel upon inspecting his two wounds. She gets a tube of tree sap from the cabinet and applies it to his wounds. The sap sterilizes the wounds as he sleeps. She wraps the wounds in bandages, and when the kids get back, she hands them clean clothes. The people in the city cut down trees and stack them so that they cannot be knocked over. They do this with haste. The people with the black veins start bashing on one of the walls soon after, though it stands strong. The kids go to sleep by Gabriel, as he's the only person they know in this new place. They sob in their sleep, waking up every two hours or so from Lovecraftian nightmares. The small children wake up in the morning, but stay still by Gabe. Gabe wakes up a little while later and looks around. He attempts to get up at camp due to his legs being extremely sore. He notices the kids sitting by the door. They're watching outside while ignoring the screams of those things from behind the barricades. They've surrounded the city, all four hastily made walls being bashed upon by the now bloody fists of the infected. Gabe wants to say something, but figures it's best he stay quiet, as the kids seem lost in thought. The stories he's heard of the people with black veins have never involved them going insane, just getting sick and dying. He makes a guess of it, being a mutation, to make the disease spread easier. This raises a question in his mind. Are there still people who aren't infected above ground? Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis Jiry. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Again, Thank you for listening and have a great day. God bless you.